You live technology change every day, so I thought I'd just wade in from the shallow end and ask you, you know, when you think about the big changes in technology that are happening today, you know, what are the things that are driving your thinking and thinking of your customers? We uh, put a strategy in place in 2010 to essentially double the addressable market of our company. And the trends that we looked at was, one, this move to big data. Um, right now, if you look at data in the world, it's doubling every 12 months. And put that into simple terms, if you stacked books from the planet Earth to Pluto 30 times, that's how much data got created in 2011 alone. And this trend is only going to continue uh, with Internet 3.0. The other piece is mobile. There are double the number of smart devices sold in the world each year now than there are people born. So the whole move to mobile, um, social, and manifesting this in these devices that are smart is changing everything. And obviously the cloud. And the cloud as both a delivery mechanism and a solution that feeds this idea of the consumerization of IT. Users are demanding that on demand they get what they want and the form factor they want it and they get it instantaneously. We took a look at these three trends, coupled that with our core business and developed a strategy that doubled our addressable market. So that's the world we see. And the thing that I've learned most of all, in 2010 we put out a five-year vision. That vision is already fully executed in two and a half years. And frankly, we were well into it in less than a year. So the pace of innovation is unbelievable. And we have to be serial innovators. Whether you're building it, partnering in a business network, or buying it, you've got to do it. Because if you don't, you're going to get blown away. That's the world we live in. Well, let's talk cloud. How, how do you see it uh, changing the enterprise? When you think about all your enterprise customers out there. How, how's cloud changing their life, the way they think, the way they work? It goes back to this personalization or this consumerization of IT because now if you're the chief marketing officer and you want brand data or instantaneous information on a market, you can access that through a nimble player that's a cloud provider of that specific solution. If you're an HR and you want to manage talent, you can get that on the run from a talent management provider who's got a public cloud. But that's only part of the story. The other part of the story is with the cloud is it's, it's a deployment model. So for example, if you're Procter & Gamble and you're Bob McDonald, you can't put Procter & Gamble in a cloud. There's data, there's security, there's globalization, there's end-to-end -end process complexity reasons why that's just not rational. So what companies are doing is they're harvesting the core, protecting the core investments that they've made over many years. And they're innovating on the edges. They're innovating at the department, at the line of business level, and obviously at the user level. Because frankly, the user with a smart device who's traveling somewhere around the world, who's instantaneously inter interested in updating their expense report or their customer relationship information, or simply trying to access something out of the billing system regarding a client inquiry, they don't care where the solution resides, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud. They just know on their device they want what they want and they want it now. And the world is going to punish companies who, doesn't enable who don't enable people to get just what they want in the form that they want it right now. If it's not right now, you toast. And one of the things that the cloud, you know, the real pure play cloud providers argue is they can innovate very quickly and, and how, how do you see that innovation um, in, a, in a large firm that's got a big piece of on-premise? Um, what's that going to look like? Everything we build is cloud-enabled. There is not an application in the world that we build today that is not fully cloud-enabled, including ERP. There's no reason that you shouldn't put ERP in the cloud. It could be a private cloud. It could be a public cloud. We have ERP customers all over the world running in Amazon, as an example. So there's no quarrel with the cloud, but there's a lot of misunderstandings about what the cloud is. And what I'm suggesting to you today is that in a public cloud scenario, small and mid have moved the whole company in there. Small numbers, but they've done it. 
Uh, the big ones have innovated at the edge and they put that into the cloud, but most are running in a, in a hybrid model. For SAP, we don't care because our entire business network will put our solution in their cloud, your private cloud, or we can provision it to you in a public cloud if you like. It doesn't matter. What really matters is that the customer gets what they want and that the customer is rethinking their entire technology architecture. There's been a lot of legacy investment over lots of different decades, and now these architectures have formed, the complexity is severe, and the cost is outrageous. The other thing is putting in software should be done on a dollar-to-dollar -dollar ratio. You shouldn't have eight or ten dollars to spend in hardware and services for every dollar of software. So we want to disintermediate what they commonly call the technology stack. We want to put all the data into main memory. So one of the breathtaking technologies that you should take away from this discussion is something called in-memory computing, RAM if you will, where you can take all the data of an enterprise and Google it. Why should people on the internet have all the fun? Why should the companies be so messed up? So we just take everything, put it into main memory in an invention we call HANA. And that will cut costs by 50% and completely blow away the stack as you know it today in technology. And we absolutely believe everything should be mobile. I mean, who wants to be tethered to a desktop? Anybody here? Just take a quick survey? No, I didn't think so. So nobody wants to do that. And whether it's in a cloud or it's on your premise, if you're accessing it on a device and you're getting a beautiful user experience, who cares? So if you're giving these guys any advice of where to go in technology, if they're going to go off and do a technology career, yeah. what advice would you give them? Well, first of all, you know, I have a, a personal passion for Dartmouth and Tuck, so I would say come to SAP. Um, but here's, here's the, the trends, as I mentioned. In technology, I see this mobile world being an unstoppable force. Um, in any capacity that you can get into mobility and how you can change the game, change the status quo with mobile solutions, you'll never miss. It's just unbelievable what's going on out there. Um, big data, uh, I, tell, I, I just can't see an end to it. I mean, think about stacking books from here to Pluto 30 times, and next year we'll be saying 60 times. Um, so these opportunities are just going to be uncanny. I've learned something, and that is simple. If you can change the status quo and radically reinvent a different way of doing things, something that adds immense economic value to people or to companies, you'll be a super successful person. This cloud thing, it's going to evolve. It's going to continue to grow. It's an unstoppable force as well. But I would go for a company that puts all of it together. So you're not making a bet on any one thing. We think we're in the neuro economy. We think that the idea is the interdependence of business networks and how you can transform the way networks interact with one another. And you've seen this on the social scene. I mean, Japan has a tsunami. Social networking basically creates work groups of people that come together to solve a problem. Arab Spring led through social and the whole internet revolution and now you have society change everywhere. And it's no longer good enough for young people to go into government because they're secure. They want to participate in the real economy. So clearly social and mobile are unbelievable forces. And if you can get with a company that, in tech anyway, that touches on these from a thought leadership or a solution and service point of view, I, I think you'd be very successful. And some may argue that uh, uh, consumers don't always know what they want. Mm -hmm. And you know, companies like Apple or Ford, um, you know, the products that are created from this company or are driven by you know, innovators thinking outside the box, if you will. So I was just wondering, uh, what, are, what would be some of the areas where you try to pull much information from the consumers, and what are, what are some other areas where you try to drive through uh, less from the, uh, from the consumer pool? Yeah, it's a great point. The greatest brands in the world don't just ask customers what they want and innovate on that information. They have the ability to anticipate what customers will need five years, even ten years down the road, 
and take them into spaces that they didn't even dream possible, but it changed the status quo, it reinvented their business models, and it made them super successful. One of those inventions, for example, is HANA. And how we do it is we innovate with university and young innovators. For example, in the Hasso Plattner Institute in Germany, we innovated HANA with students that were, you know, just like you, um, probably even younger, that were given a challenge, a business case. We think this is a dumb way to store data in a world where it's doubling every 12 months. If you agree, build us something that can transform the way companies manage data in corporate enterprises around the world. Out of that came an in-memory computing appliance called HANA, which is today revolutionizing the way the biggest, mid-sized, and even small companies are going to run their business all around the world. So it's thinking about a problem that no one's actually thought of solving yet and then getting really innovative, smart people to think totally out of the box. Use design thinking. Put some structure around it in, in the form of design thinking, but come out with something that no one else has even thought of. And we have to do that to stay ahead of the game. Even if you're customer driven, even if you have a good business network, even if you're strategic with your M&A, you still, at our size and scale, going to have to bring organic innovation, new creations, new inventions to the, to the party, or you just won't be a high growth company. Initially you mentioned you doubled your addressable market, and I imagine in doing that, and this is an assumption I'm making, so correct me if I'm wrong, but a big part of that has to come from getting into the small to medium sized businesses, right? Which SAP typically, it, it hasn't been like a sweet spot for you guys. Um, so how, when you're going into that, especially around 2010, how did you make the move to get in there, especially when there was players such as uh, like Salesforce.com, which already had a, a pretty good lock on that segment of the market and in the cloud computing space as well? Yeah. So um, if you look at 24 industries, small, mid, and large, we had 110 billion addressable. When you went to cloud, you went to in-memory because that was the new innovation around data, and you went to mobile, you got another 110 billion. That's how I got the math on the 220 billion. Now, what's uh, not such a well-known fact about SAP is we have about 200,000 customers globally now. So we kind of blew through the Fortune 1000 a while ago. But yet the world, because of our branding and the way we started with big companies, has this perception that SAP is for the big one. And that's why in the ad that you saw in the beginning, you saw for an office of one. So we're changing people's minds. And we have to keep working at it. I mean, this is not an easy battle. Brands lock in people's minds, and then you got to change their minds. Now, Salesforce did a very good job on selling to the sales department within an enterprise. But that doesn't take into account warehousing, logistics, manufacturing, financials, human capital, supplier relationships, even the broad uh, topics around CRM. Because CRM is far more than contact management and leads. As the executive running your company, you're going to want to sit back someday and say, look, I've got to rebalance my business model. I'm going long on China and long on India. I'm shorting UK, Germany, and the US to the tune of 20% across the board because my sales are down. From a headcount and an EPS standpoint, show me that instantaneously. If you have SAP CRM in the cloud with HANA, that'll do it for you. So the world is going to evolve so quick behind, be, behind these you know, cloud companies that are one-trick ponies. It's going to be just like in the 90s and to the early 2000s when you had the innovators in the enterprise that were best of breed. What I used to tell them all the time, meaning in the boardroom, I'd say to customers, hey, look, they may be best, but they sure didn't breed because you have an <coughs> enterprise that doesn't work together. And that's going to take place in the cloud over time as well. So what our vision was for small and mid, put it all on a platform in the cloud. The entire value chain of a company, not just one department. Because what's happening to a lot of small companies now is they'll have Salesforce, they'll have Workday, they'll have Taleo, they'll have like 10 of them strung together in crazy ways. And you're like, okay, you're signing Sarbay's Oxley forms, 
you're now a big boy CEO running a three or four hundred million company. How you feeling? Insecure. I don't have any transparency. I don't have visibility. I can't see into the logistics of the transactional systems in my company. I don't know what's going on. So that's sort of the balancing act, right? Innovate at the edge, but make sure the core is tight. So I think that's our opportunity as well as our challenge. Change people's minds, be realistic about this hybrid world that we see, and I do see the small ones eventually going all to the cloud to run an end-to-end -end value chain. The biggest risk you will take in this environment is not taking risks. I, I go to bed at night, if I didn't take a chance or make a bet, and it should be a bold bet, because only the bold bet get people's attention and create energy, I get real nervous about myself. So 10, 15 years ago, if you asked SAP, they probably would have said, hey, we're the best, slow and steady. You know, here's the wedge chart. Let's tell Wall Street the best EPS story that anyone could ever imagine. Now it's like, we should disrupt ourselves before someone else has a chance to. Let's go after new markets that matter to the customer. And I keep going back to this, you know, personalization for the customer, this customer experience. It has to be magic, it has to be simple, low cost. And then, of course, simplify everything. If you can innovate on the edge and keep the core stable, innovation without disruption, that's what customers want today, that's what you should do. And then you have to move at a speed that is just blistering fast. Under control, but fast. Uh, there is a lot of innovation around this pain point, uh, open stack, cloud stack, eucalyptus, uh, all, of, all of them are trying to enable the deployment of private cloud. So is SAP making a conscious effort of partnering with these companies um, and helping your current customers uh, build their private clouds? Because you know, in the end, um, the IT performance of your current customers can reflect on SAP, and if they don't have the private cloud infrastructure, they are still, you know, there is a huge cost, and they are not getting the best out of their SAP systems. I think you're 100% right, and I'll give you an example. So you're the CEO. And you have a, let's just put it this way, you have a one billion IT budget. 85% of it, or 850 million today, goes to keeping the lights on and the trains running on time. 150 million of it's going to doing new things to innovate your business. Now you're mad when you hear that, right? You want to do something about it. And we're mad too, and we want to help you. What I'd like to see you do is cut the infrastructure to 500 million, max, right out of the gates. Let's take 350 million and apply it to innovation, where we can change your customer relationship, we can automate your supplier network, we can get you into markets like the BRIC or other parts of the world where perhaps you're not competitive enough. Let's do things with your brand, let's start really helping your people. So our pitch is real simple. Out of that one billion today you're giving me tops, 50 million. You give me 100 million. I'll take you, I'll take you to 500 million and 500 million in the mix. And anyone who helps me get that 350 million out is my friend and your friend. Now we're talking. That's the call. And that's what we do. So we turn on the business network, whatever makes sense, I see people buying hardware for 90% more than they should pay, 90. And all these things, to me, as a, a CEO, I'm like, I want someone to come in with an idea that resonates with me. And that's the idea that every CEO I talk to can get their arms around real fast. That's why one of the things you'll see in technology today is more and more business people are becoming CIOs and CTOs because the CEO wants someone sitting next to him that gets business. It's like, look, man, we're not here to just like fill up this place with hardware or do your pet IT project. We want to change the way we run the company. So big picture, and, and, it, and it drills right into your sweet spot. All these folks envision themselves as, as being leaders uh, in, in big organizations like you're in. What are the biggest, you know, one of the biggest challenges you've faced at a personal level in that leadership role? Well, I think, you know, people tend to find the, their role in life that they love. And 
professionally speaking, I'm doing what I love to do. So I'm not going to work. I'm really going to have some fun. And I feel like what I do can make a difference in people's lives if I stay humble and I do what I'm supposed to do for the good of the company, the good of the customer, the good of the people, and obviously the good of the shareholder, but do the right thing. And that professionally is really fulfilling. And I could live on that uh, for a long time. As it relates to the biggest challenges I think executives face, it's a, it's a very uh, demanding job. Um, for somebody like me that puts family first, um, you're always in the back of your mind saying, am I doing all the things I need to do to cover home base? Uh, do I have enough discretionary time to really invest in the things that I know, you know, when you get the two-minute warning in life, matter the most? And I think you have to be a balanced person. Some people that I see, they are very unbalanced. And, you know, they might be great in the office, but they're lousy at home. And I think you just want to walk away from this world saying, hey, I did the job, but I didn't let the job take my soul. I managed my life holistically, and therefore, I'm a happy person. I think that's the key, keeping it all in balance. Fantastic message to end our talk. Yeah. Thanks so much, Bill. Thank yeah. you very much for having me, everybody. Thank you. I really appreciate it.